Okay, folks, here we are with uh, yet another teeny tiny tutorial from NOS LLC. That's me. Um, somebody asked for a little bit of data on wave division multiplexing. So I uh, ripped off a whole bunch of my kids' Tricity uh, cartoonies and put together this really short thing, if I can get through it quickly enough, uh, about wave division multiplexing. What is this stuff? Well, let's uh, take a look at it. Wave muxing. It's a, this is a beginning level material, so I'm taking a lot of liberties like I always do. Uh, you can read this stuff if you like. Uh, it's really helpful if you have some understanding of direct current, which uh, can support digital signals, um, and alternating current, which uh, supports analog signals. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, you can certainly uh, hang on with this. Um, probably get most of what I'm going to tell you, but uh, Having basic electronics is really, really important to, uh, to understand any of these technologies that I uh, put even in these simplified tutorials. So here we go. Why would you want to use a multiplexer? What is a multiplexer? Well, it's really a device or a way or a method of uh, reducing the cost for uh, sending information from one place to the other. Um, because if we can put um, multiple transmission streams onto a single physical transmission path, it makes the path cheaper uh, per call, if you will. So it's a path efficiency. That's what we're after. And uh, pretty much uh, most of the technologies we have in the uh, telephone and uh, data industry are aimed in that direction, uh, path efficiency, cheaper per call, per transmission. All right, so look at a little history of some muxes here. This uh, is the simplest circuit you could possibly put together. It's a two-wire circuit. I've got a tip wire, the green one, and a ring wire, the red one, and a phone, and a phone, and a whole bunch of stuff that's not shown on here. So there's no mux here because I've got a single call on a single facility, a tip and ring twisted pair. So a MUX is just a method or a device or a way of putting many things onto one thing. Well, I've only got one call on one transmission path, so uh, they ain't no MUX at all. Here is, in fact, a time division multiplexing methodology, although no one ever thought of it this way. Uh, in this case, I've got a switch out here with some wire, tip and ring, going out to multiple customers. Right? And over here on this side of the switch, multiple customers. And they're all tied physically together. So, normally known as a party line, when this person is talking to that person, these people are nice enough not to listen in. Uh, yeah, because this call right here is used for some length of time. Then they drop off, and these two people can then use that same facility for some length of time. A party line. It's really a multiplexing in time. That is that they're nice folks. Right. So that doesn't really tell us about where we're going with that light stuff, though, does it? Let's move forward uh, like this. Here's an example of what's known as a space division multiplexing methodology. Now, there's no box or anything, no electronics involved in this. But if you think about it for a minute, it's like this. This call right here, their tip and ring wire, goes into a large cable. This guy's tip and ring wire goes into a large cable. The cable is, in fact, a space mux because the cable is carrying multiple calls, this one and this one, and the calls, the physical wire, are separated in space by the plastic insulation around the wire. Now, that's kind of stretching the idea, huh? Mm, well, in fact, if you mess around with the switching guys, and I try to avoid that as much as possible, but um, the switching people, they use that term quite often. Uh, when we move information from one side of the switch over to the other side of the switch, that's a space switcher, because I'm moving stuff in space, the final frontier. Um, but that still doesn't get us where we want to go, does it? Mm -mm. But... You get the idea. Let's move forward here. This one is a, an original, very original, electrical kind of a mux. Now, once again, there's no box, but think about this. I've got a call on this tip and ring two wire that's going to this tip and ring two wire over here, but I've got some transformers in the middle. But I've got one call on one transmission path, and I've got a second call down here on a second transmission path right here. But Guess what? I can sneaky carry a third trans, uh, third call, third transmission path by center tapping this 
transformer right here and right here to carry my ring side of this call and I can center tap this transformer here and here to carry the tip side of this call. So off of two two wire circuits I can get three calls by center tapping this. The, back in the bad old days these were always called phantom circuits because right? you can kind of like make something out of nothing. Uh, they were used a lot because it uh, is certainly cheaper. I paid for this set of two wires and this set of two wires, but guess what? Oh, for freebie, I get a third call. No extra charge. Nah, but that's still not getting us over to that light stuff, so let's move to this one. Ooh, wave division multiplexing. What's it? Yeah, what is this stuff? Well, here's, here's the big surprise for you. It's just another name for frequency division multiplexing but we're going to use light and I have that in parentheses because most of us think of light as something you can see but um, light in this case is a wider range of frequencies so this is a slide I got out of uh, guess what kids tricity and didn't make any changes here frequency division of multiplexing oldest and least complicated parallel method of sending simultaneously information streams on a single wireline or wireless path meaning wire, copper, twisted pair, coax, or something like that, or wireless, meaning a radio. And I'm showing you here, um, actually, uh, AM and FM radio spectrum uh, from a mapping, um, which you might want to go out and get, because this is great. This uh, complete map right here, go out to this location. It's a really fine, fine um, map of uh, the entire electromagnetic spectrum, starting from zero hertz cycles per second if you're an old guy like me uh, up to uh, 10 to the 25th uh, cycles per second or Hertz right we're going to be dealing with this in our fiber optic systems but on our wire systems we've been doing this for a long time and on our uh, radiating systems radio systems we've been doing this for a long time so go get that that's a really good one um, as a matter of fact, I ripped part of it off over here. You know, it's a little fair use uh, rip off. Uh, I know you can't read this, but this part right here, you can probably make that out. It says this is the radio spectrum right here. And it gives everything from zero all the way up here to uh, cosmic rays. Mm, yeah, way up here. Um, so I'm giving you an example of uh, frequency division multiplexing, uh, one I've used uh, many, many times on uh, this thing called N type carrier system. Um, this is how it works, frequency stacking, pancake stacking, however you want to look at it. I bring in a 4 kilohertz channel from a uh, telephone, because this is standard for the telephone industry, 4 kilohertz channels. And I modulate it uh, with a high frequency oscillator and come out, boink, over here with uh, 256 kilohertz for that single channel. Simultaneously, I can have other 4 kilohertz channels coming in here, which get modulated to different frequencies. All right? They're all existing on a twisted pair at the same time. It's kind of like pancakes all stacked up here. This is frequency division. Each one of those channels, and there are 12 of them in this analog N-type carrier system, guess what? Uh, this was a precursor to the T-type that everybody wants to talk about. This is a standard grouping of 12 channels. Kind of went off on a tangent there. Um, so this is how you stack them up on twisted pair frequency division multiplexing. We've been doing this since the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, let's move over here to the next system. I'm showing you an L-type carrier system. Now I bring in sub-channels here that are made up of a whole bunch of these all grouped together. All right? And I do the same thing. I, I multiplex, uh, multiplex, I um, uh, modulate them into uh, a channel or a frequency somewhere between 64 kilohertz and 3096 kilohertz. Now you notice uh, here I've got a little kind of an aside here and here and actually I had one over here and here. That's to show you what the length of the wave would be if you could see one. Uh, how long it would be in meters if you could measure it with a yardstick and this is a wave right up here. This is one cycle of a wave right here. So from here to here is the length so depending on the frequency will determine how long, how much time, or how physically long this thing would be. And you'll notice that uh, the lower frequency right here compared to the higher frequency 
as you go higher in frequency the length of the wave gets shorter over here it's much more obvious uh, the length of the wave at 64 kilohertz is uh, four, uh, over 4,000 meters, but when you get up here to 3096, it's only 96 meters long. So it's real obvious the higher frequency you go, the shorter the wavelength. But keep this in mind, we never ever used uh, a description of the wavelength on these early systems. It just wasn't done. We always talked about the frequency of the channel, the frequency of the channel, not the wavelength of the channel. Ah, so let's move forward a little bit here boink, and look at a radio system right? FM radio once again I'm gonna have a sub channel coming in here maybe 40 kilohertz 80 kilohertz I don't know it really depends on the radio station so they bring that sub channel in here and do the same daggone thing they mash this thing in here heterodyne it, uh, mush it, uh, whatever term you like um, uh, modulate it so that it comes flying out of here onto the radio antenna in this case uh, between 88 megahertz and 108 megahertz for FM radio and it uh, radiates in free space uh, you notice back over here I had this on twisted pair that works fine but when I went up to these higher frequency I had to go to coax well in free space I can radiate this stuff at a much higher uh, range 88 to 108 and once again I'm giving you the length of the wave here three meters long two meters long right higher frequency shorter wave but once again we just never talked about these in our transmission systems although some of the uh, like CB radio guys they did they talk about you know I'm on the 10 meter band 50 meter band 2000 meter band one meter band I don't know I used to listen to those guys and wonder why in the world they did that, you know. You want to talk to somebody that you never talked to before, that was a big deal. I guess it was back in the old days. Um, now you just pick up the phone and dial a random number. It works kind of the same way. Oh, man, I'm being nasty now. I'm being nasty. Um, so we've got uh, short and shorter. Why? Because it's a higher frequency. So let's finally move over here to our radio system, uh, radio, our uh, light uh, system. So once again, I bring in sub channels, but notice this time I have bits per second because what I'm really going to do is pulse this light coming out here. Over here, I had uh, analog in, analog out, but over here, I'm going to have to have digital in because, as far as I know, nobody is uh, modulating these uh, light waves in an analog form yet. We're still pulsing them. I could be wrong because I don't keep up with this stuff anymore, but I haven't seen anything about that. So I'm going to pulse. So I've got to digitize any analog stuff way back over here. Uh, I'm going to pulse this uh, uh, light. And I have a whole range here. Uh, this is a fiber uh, commercial system here. And I, I didn't even put the frequency in here because everybody wants to talk about these as the wavelength now. See, instead of you know, over here where I talk about the frequency and didn't talk about the wavelength, over here I want to talk about the wavelength, but I typically don't talk about the frequency. So a commercial system here, 650 nanometers. That's a pretty short little uh, wave, huh? Uh, up here to um, 1,625 nanometers. Hmm? Get the idea? Okay. So let's move over to this one. Because you can't see the actual uh, color, um, because it's not a really a color. It's a, um, beyond the vision of a human being. I've substituted color over here uh, to give you an idea how this works. I bring in my sub-channel, bits per second, and I'm going to pulse an outgoing light. In this case, a violet light, which is someplace in this uh, frequency range, terahertz, I'm giving you a frequency range here, and the uh, uh, nanometer length. So I bring in a digital signal and I pulse this on and off, on and off a lot of times, terahertz. Right? Um, and then I bring a second signal in here and pulse the blue light, and a third signal and pulse the, this one, and pulse this one, and pulse this one. So I can have lots of input uh, channels here and I pulse these different color lights and all these are going down this single fiber the one fiber all by itself so effectively I have parallel signals going out here that I'm pulsing these lights on and off and on and off but as I said you can't see this what you really have are what are known as bands and they're not visible you, at least not to anybody but Superman 
Um, and these are the bands O, E, S. You got. You can read this one, two, three, four, five, six bands for our commercial systems. Um, but then keep this in mind, just like our other things, our radio systems, our uh, carrier systems on wire, we can subdivide these channels. You can think of it this way, is that I've got shades of red, many shades of red. Each one of the shades can be a channel. Right? Shades of orange, each one of the shades can be a channel. So the bands themselves can be collectively submultiplexed into hundreds of these parallel channels, all going out on the same fiber at the same time. All right, so I can get huge, huge amounts of uh, bits or data through these kinds of systems. All right, so it's the same thing we've looked at many times before. It's just an old, old, old concept operating on a new physical technology. From my perspective as a tech, I was a field tech, not a design engineer. The part that gave us the most trouble was back here in the data compression and modulation methods because if the optical electrical transceiver, the sender receiver, didn't work, usually you just pull that thing out. It's a little card. You know, throw it away. Get another one. Right? The, the troubleshooting and the, the thing you needed to know was back in here. Right? So am I going to go through that? No, that's uh, for a different uh, tutorial. So how you go about all this data compression. This is really interesting stuff. Basically, fiber optic systems are a flashlight and a photo cell. Oh, man, that just torqued off a whole bunch of de design engineers. Yeah. Well, it's not just a flashlight and a photo cell. Well, yeah, okay, it is for our perspective. So uh, I might go into one of these over here because that's, that's a lot more interesting from my perspective as a field tech. Perhaps I'll do another one. Perhaps you'll watch it later.